Hello Team LDH, thank you for the incredibly hard work that you have done to help Louisiana through this pandemic. This past 14 months have been tough, personally and professionally, and I know that you have made great sacrifices and through it all, you've displayed professionalism, compassion, dedication, and used your experience and knowledge to keep our people safe and healthy. Thank you also for attending this Q&A about COVID vaccines. Many of you have questions, and this is an opportunity for you to get the answers that you need to make an informed decision. That's a good thing. So as you learn about the COVID vaccines, please consider becoming a health ambassador. As a member of Team LDH, you are an incredible messenger. Your words and your actions matter to your coworkers, your family, to your friends, and to your community. This is something we're asking everyone who is vaccinated to do. Thanks again for your hard work in helping to put an end to this pandemic once and for all, and to bring back the Louisiana that we know and love. God bless. Personally, it was important for me to get vaccinated to protect my son knowing I was coming back and forth into the office, going to the Capitol work meetings. So it was really important that I did every effort I could to protect him, as well as the team members who had to work in the building and interact with others. So making sure that I did all that I could to protect the team members during this pandemic. As we continue to gather survey information, we're not hearing from a large percentage of individuals in terms of outright refus refusals for getting the vaccine. But what we're hearing from folks through door knocking, phone banking, and local polling is that people have questions and they wanna be able to have the opportunity to ask those questions to individuals who have a clinical background as well as those with lived experience. And so we wanna make sure that we do all that we can to provide those opportunities for individuals to be able to make that decision. I want you to know that this is just one opportunity, uh, one form in doing that. So as you have questions, please continue to use the department as a resource. We wanna make sure you have what you need to make that decision. As the governor said, your words and your actions about vaccines matter, and folks are looking to you. So we appreciate you taking time today to listen, to ask questions, and to be involved. And before I turn it over to our moderator, I do want to, again, stress my thanks to you for helping out your fellow Louisianians and the department as a whole during this pandemic and the extraordinary times. So thank you for being who you are and a part of Team LDH. And now I'm pleased to introduce our uh, moderator, Mr. Greg uh, Mayweather. We are so appreciative of Mr. Merriweather um, participating and serving as our moderator. I know he's a familiar face to everyone and a trusted voice in our community. And we thank him for all that he has done for us. He's an Emmy award-winning journalist and has been with WAFB for two decades, um, serving as the anchor in the evening news and is also WAFB's managing editor. So Greg, thank you so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. All right, sorry about that. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, I just wanna say quickly as a citizen of Louisiana, I very much appreciate all that you all have done and, and helped us out. It, it's helped us get the message out to the people. So we certainly appreciate that. Did wanna go over just a couple of quick things and just remind everybody that this is recorded so uh, people can view it later. So uh, all of this will be recorded. And then some of the uh, state employees were able to submit their questions ahead of time. Uh, that's why we've been able to get to some of those during the uh, re registration process. There will be another opportunity though, if something maybe gets in your mind while we're talking about different things or answering some of these questions, you'll be able to submit some of the uh, some of your questions in the chat feature or the Q&A uh, session there. And we might not be able to get to those, we'll try. If we don't get to them, they're gonna compile all of those. They'll answer them, uh, even if it's not right here in this, and then put that in a document and that'll be sent out to all of your emails and it'll also be on the LDH website. So that'll be uh, good to know. So if you have a question uh, that's not answered, get it to us and we will get it answered and then get it back to you. I wanna introduce quickly our uh, panel here. Uh, we've got a terrific uh, set of folks uh, from all across our area. We're gonna start with uh, Dr. Veronica Gillespie Bell. She is a board certified obstetrician uh, and gynecologist and associate professor for Oshner Health in New Orleans. She serves as the senior site lead and section head of the obstetrics and gynecology at Oshner Kenner. Additionally, she serves as the Director of Quality for Women's Services for Ochsner and is the Medical Director of the Minimally Invasive Center for Treatment of Uterian Uterine Fibroids. She is also the Medical Director of the Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative and Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review for Louisiana Department of Health. 
So while I might have jumbled some of that, that means she's very important and we'll be able to answer a lot of your good questions there. Dr. Ikoi Rooney is a distinguished leader. She's got more than 20 years of nursing experience. She's recognized forensic nursing and nursing leadership expert. She's a director of nursing leadership development for Austin Health and the president of the Louisiana State Nurses Association. She's a graduate of Loyola University with a master's in science and nursing and also Southeast Louisiana University with a doctor of nursing practitioner degree. Our third uh, panelist probably needs no introduction. He is uh, well known now around the state, Dr. Joseph Cantor. He's the top medical official for the Louisiana Department of Health. Basically, he has taken a very frontline role with the governor in helping the state navigate this uh, coronavirus pandemic. He's been a very calming voice through all of this. We always appreciate when he uh, takes the podium uh, and gets a lot of the questions answered. Also, uh, Jonetta Bell Kelly is with us. She serves as the CDC National Center for Immu Immunization and Respiratory Diseases Immunization Services Division. As a public health analyst, she co-leads the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force's Disproportionately Affected Adults Population Racial and Ethnic Subunit. She served as First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move representative. Prior to rejoining the CDC, Jonetta was the Deputy Director of the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Community Partnerships and Health Equity. So we are well, glad to have her here as well. Dr. David Chow, Cho is here with us. He is an Associate Director for Preparedness and Response within the FDA. His duties include advising on emergency policy issues, formulating appropriate uh, responses. Prior to this, he was the Influenza Program Officer in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Also with us is Senator Regina Barrow, she is a long time public servant and was just recently reelected to the Louisiana Senate for District 15. Uh, if you live in our area, you know her very well. She shared with me and the community that she recently lost her husband to COVID last year. And even before that, she was a big time champion for COVID-19 preparedness and awareness, uh, just even really since the beginning of the pandemic. So thank you to her. And last but not least, Dr. Cliff Moore, he works at the Maternal Fetal Medicine High Risk uh, Specialist at Women's Hospital here in Baton Rouge. Dr. Moore is a native of North Louisiana. He completed his medical degree at LSU in Shreveport, OBGYN residency at the University Hospital in Jackson, Mississippi. He's a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He was previously the director of maternal fetal medicine at Ochsner Health System and currently is the division director for fetal care and intervention at Women's Hospital. So we give you uh, all of their bios to kind of let you know what their area of expertise are. So you hear some people work maybe with pregnant women. So if you're out there, you're pregnant, you might have a few questions uh, for the doctor on that side of it. Maybe you have a few questions on how we're responding to things. So as you hear the different bios, you can see where we have our different experts. All right, we're going to bounce around here. I'm going to start with the very first question uh, that, that uh, we have here on our list, and it goes to David Cho. Uh, Dr. Cho, what do you say to people who have questions or concerns after the pausing and then the restarting of this Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Uh, what are the risks? Let's say we have some of our LDH employees out there right now who are female. They're, they're in that age category, 18 to 49. What would you advise them? Should they get the Johnson & Johnson shot? Should they wait for the others? What would you say? So first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me and hopefully everyone can hear me clearly. Um, so for FDA, so I'm representing FDA today, uh, one of the most important things was really being transparent and giving information to the public. And so uh, we've been committed to doing that. And so throughout the vaccine development process, uh, we've been doing this post authorization surveillance. And so therefore, when we saw this rare signal of this thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, uh, it's a rare combination that was detected by our adverse reporting systems. We have wanted to be really clear to inform the public and really provide the necessary information for doctors uh, so that they can properly treat the potential symptoms regarding this. The actual incidence after reviewing this and continue to review this, the actual incidence of these block blood clots are, are still very rare, uh, even for the women within this age range of 18 to 49. So the risks are very low and, and really within the range of maybe one, one in a million at, at most at this point. And so therefore, I really would truly continue to recommend the Johnson Johnson vaccine. But the wonderful news is that we are very fortunate that we have two other uh, great vaccines, these mRNA vaccines that are available as alternate options. And so I would recommend all three, but uh, the Johnson Johnson is available, but the other ones are also too. Thank you for that. 
Dr. Kanner, I'd like to um, ask you, since uh, the, the newest thing that we've really heard is the lifting of the mask mandate in certain parts, the governor has left it up to uh, local leaders and business leaders. Oh, can you tell us a little bit more about that decision and what went into that decision, uh, what you looked at and what made you guys come up with the, the final thing to uh, say, okay, let's uh, move a little bit toward uh, taking the mask off. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Greg. I do want to just uh, specifically welcome Dr. Cho and uh, Drenetta Bell Kelly uh, from out of state. Drenetta used to work with us and now works for the CDC and Dr. Cho is a great expert to have. So thanks for joining us for this. And the question um, is about uh, the mask mandate being lifted and, and what went into that decision. The first thing to say, Greg, is while the mandate might be lifted in some settings, not all settings, the recommendation, the public health recommendation very much still holds. You know, COVID is much lower in Louisiana now than it was six or seven months ago. Not totally. And low, lower risk does not mean no risk. There still is COVID, but it's significantly less. And everyone 16 and above now has the opportunity to get vaccinated. And it's not just an opportunity in theory or on paper. We are fortunate to have more supply than we can use right now in Louisiana, which means there are not wait lists to get the vaccine. It's in 1,500 locations across the state. It's really easy to get right now. So putting those things together, the governor felt it was appropriate to no longer mandate masking across the board, but the recommendation to do so is still there. I'll tell you, I will still mask every time I go into an indoor space where there are unvaccinated people in there, 100% of the time. It's the best way to protect me and it's the best way to give confidence that I'm protecting those around me. Masks are still gonna be required in public transportation, still required in healthcare settings. And a number of cities, New Orleans and some others, are gonna require masks in those cities. So I don't think anyone should get the impression that the pandemic's over or that they should go unmasked. It just means that the state is step-by-step step, as it's been doing the entire time rolling back regulations as the numbers allow for it. But the recommendation very much is still there. Thank you, sir, for that, appreciate it. Let's get some uh, out of state, but homegrown uh, expertise here. Uh, Jonetta Bell Kelly, uh, how can health professionals better promote the message that these COVID-19 vaccines are safe? So if you've got some LDH employees out there that are, are watching this and it's not so much in, maybe in their regular job, they have to promote it as well, but they've got family members asking them questions. What would be your response to that, that to, to give them some information to let people know that these vaccines are safe? Well, thanks for having me, um, Greg. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm really proud to be here today as an LDH alum. <laughs> um, you know, one of the most damaging issues to public health, as we all know, is when misinformation bleeds over into confusion, uh, causing division, frustration, and resistance. So one thing that I've learned and that we've learned at the CDC is before professionals can actually promote a message, they need to first acknowledge how their audience are feeling about the vaccine. It's really important to be understanding of individuals who are honestly afraid of what they've heard about potential side effects or are skeptical about uh, what has happened in the process of bringing these vaccines to the public. You know, we can't get on our high horses as public health leaders and just tell individuals to just go get a shot. We have to be cognizant of general vaccine um, hesitancy, fears, and misinformation. So the important message is to only speak from data and to be transparent about what you know and what you don't know. You know, explain things to your patients and your constituents so that they can not only build trust, but actually garner knowledge about the vaccine. Share information about the FDA's emergency use authorization approval process. Introduce them to the advisory committee on immunization practices public forums so that they can hear about vaccination processes firsthand. You know, explain to them in people first language how antibodies work. What's the 101 on how vaccines work in your body? Also, be clear about the potential side effects and discuss the factors. Um, listen to their concerns, dispel myths, and encourage them to speak with their family members about what they have learned so they can make the best decisions for their families. In addition, acknowledging that all members of the care team, including everyone from the person who delivers food to the patient's room, to the CNAs, to the discharge representatives, and other direct care representatives are all 
considered trusted messengers to patients and constituents. So when they are in the hospital in their scrubs performing a task, regardless of their pay grade, they become the trusted source. So due to this, it's really important that all members of the care team are trained on what they should and shouldn't say to patients regarding their personal beliefs about the vaccine. Um, another thing that public health professionals can do is equip trusted messengers throughout the community to deliver the messages. So it will not just appear to be coming from some random government or person you know, uh, speaking with them. As much as we respect science and data, every person is not interested in sitting through a teletown hall about vaccination. So we have to be creative with our approaches. You have to use uh, community networks like Black fraternities and sororities, uh, faith communities, HBCUs, uh, Black and Latinx medical nursing schools, um, promotores, uh, local radio stations and local cultural networks to promote the message. And lastly, uh, building social media strategies and campaigns. Uh, we have to make sure we encourage the community to seek credible messages about the vaccination. As we all know, in this social media age, when misinformation, disinformation and unscientific data spreads throughout the chats or if there's a lack of transparency, it definitely creates a barrier to addressing the needs of each person or community. And CDC recognizes this as um, and is responding by supporting our partners with science-driven data and health communication support. Uh, CDC's communication efforts include mitigating information on social media by listening and identifying trending anti-vax messaging, um, intervening and responding to concerns with positive vaccine messaging, and continuously monitoring and advocating for social media platform policy change. Uh, CDC is promoting accurate vaccine messaging through campaigns and partnerships by developing culturally appropriate messaging as well, uh, delivered through influences and, and engaging. So it's a lot of work to be done still, uh, but this is a great start in laying the foundation of promoting vaccinations among public health networks. Thank you for that. I think the part that stuck with me is you very eloquently said we just need to be very real in our language and just uh, speak uh, right where the folks are. And uh, you're right, that certified nursing assistant or whomever it may be just in your room, if they're in scrubs in a lot of people's minds, that's the doctor in there. So, you know, they're asking questions and it, it is good to know that they would at least be able to say, yeah, I got my vaccine or, um, yeah, I think it's safe. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, we, we do have to realize that just about everybody, uh, you know, is going to ask their, their mom, their aunt, their uncle, or just uh, about what they can do. So thank you for that. Speaking of the nurses, uh, Dr. Rooney, um, we had talked about uh, reaching all of these communities. What about if you're in the nursing profession, you've just now caught your breath, uh, but you know that there's still work to be done. Uh, what do you say about reaching some of the folks in, in the, these so-called out of reach communities? Certainly. So <clears throat> thank you so much for having uh, me with you today. I really think that nurses as the most trusted profession have an obligation to not only be vaccinated, but to really be champions of vaccination, to talk about it in any places possible, obviously. Um, Dr. Bell really shared a lot of different suggestions about those types of communities, but really having these conversations about our trust in science, um, about the understanding you know, of the safety of the vaccination. I think a lot of people in the beginning were saying things like, I think I'm gonna wait till we know a little more. And so I think that at this point, we need to really be encouraging people through our own stories about vaccination. I know that there still is hesitancy even in our own uh, nursing community in some areas about vaccination. And so really having these conversations at every level, as a matter of fact, we just had our membership assembly for our, uh, our, our body, our member of body uh, for the Louisiana State Nurses Association. And one of the resolutions that we are looking to approve with our next session is on vaccination and really that is gonna be our focus until this vaccine is over or until everybody has a vaccine uh, that, that is willing to take it. But hopefully we can increase those numbers. A lot of uh, conversations need to be happening really at every level. We need to seek to understand what the hesitancy is and address it. And I do see a couple of questions uh, related to the 
boosters in how long does the immunity last? Why should I get vaccinated if it doesn't last long? Or even what should I do to make sure that I keep myself and my family safe going forward? So I know those questions will be addressed, but I think we need to have that information available that we can continue to encourage. As a matter of fact, my own children are, are currently in the Pfizer trial, my under 15 kids, uh, my son and my daughter. And I talk about that a lot to people so that they understand that you know, I'm placing my, my own children in this, um, in this opportunity to help advance science and they are very excited about it. The walk in the walk and talk in the talk, that, that, that's, I think that will resonate with a, a lot of folks there. Uh, Dr. Moore, uh, we might have some pregnant women out there that are concerned about whether it be the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or just the vaccines in general. At first, it was said, well, maybe the pregnant women should hold off because they weren't involved in the original trials, and then we let them in. Uh, what, what, what are your messages to anyone out there that might be pregnant or who may have a daughter that, that, that's pregnant and may be concerned about this? So... Uh... I've been practicing now delivering babies for approximately 20 years. And within this last year and a half, uh, I've seen more maternal deaths than I've ever seen in my whole career. This is a bad disease for pregnant women. Uh, and it's a very scary disease for us to come across. Uh, and there are a lot of people in Louisiana who have risk factors for this disease to get really bad really quick. Uh, I'm a big fan of the vaccine in all the pregnant women. Uh, and if you have risk factors, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, I'm really encouraging people to get the vaccine. Uh, it is is something like I've never seen before, and uh, we we really need to fight it. It's 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 bad. It's really bad. Uh, and and this vaccines. I know there's questions concerning the different types of vaccines. Uh, my opinion is get whatever vaccine you can get and get it as quick as you can. Uh, from a pregnancy standpoint, uh, it's it, this disease is really aggressive in pregnant women. And they, uh, this is our best shot to keep them protected. Thank you for that. Um, Senator Barrow, uh, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, obviously, you have your own personal uh, struggle with COVID, as unfortunately so many in our state do. Um, I'm just interested in what that taught you. And then uh, I guess that would keep you maybe even going even further to reach uh, some more people in your community, not just your district, but the people you go to church with and, and the people that you, you know, um, hang out with those are the people that sometimes we might be missing there are uh, there are aunties there are uh, in, in some families the big mamas the it's it's the older african americans that have somewhat seemed a little bit uh, hesitant in this and then some of the younger ones because they're watching what some of their uh, respected individuals are doing thank you so much greg for that question and, and thank you for being the moderator for this um, wonderful town hall meeting i want to thank the governor for his leadership through this entire situation he has certainly done a wonderful job along with uh, secretary phillips and your entire uh, ldh team i want to thank all of you guys because it's been one incident or one situation after the other and you guys have just really stood up and did your job but as you stated early on, um, Greg, you know, I have my own personal story. I lost my husband now coming up to five months. I can't believe it's almost five months. Um, I lost him in December. We were uh, diagnosed in November and by December 5th, he was gone. So everything happened very quickly. Uh, but for me, this is extremely personal uh, that I am educating the community about the importance about the vaccine. Um, I have done it by example. And when I took the vaccine, I allowed it to be done live so people can see me. Uh, and I've gone back and reported that I'm doing well. And so I believe that it's important that we take that level of messaging and we allow people to know that A, we've been vaccinated and then B, continue to let people know that we're doing well. Uh, there are a lot of people who are sitting on the fence line waiting to see if there are going to be any adverse effect to people that they know. And so I think the more that they see that the people that they know are, are doing fine and are, are able to get back to some sense of normalcy, uh, I think that really helps. I too, uh, I saw someone put on that earlier that they are going to be following Dr. Cantor's advice. I will be too. I'm still wearing my mask. Uh, but in order for us to be able to be responsible citizens, uh, I believe we have to do our part. And that's a part of the responsibility. Um, doing your part, getting the vaccine, being more healthier uh, so that you are able to interact with people. Because one thing about the virus um, that we need to continue to let people know is highly contagious. 
And so while some people may uh, get the virus and they may not have any effects, they may not even know that they have it, they can give it to someone else very easily. But when we have the vaccine, then that covers everybody. When you take the vaccine, then that covers you from everybody else. Thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I think your story has touched a, a lot of people across the way. Um, Dr. Veronica, I, I did have a question about, um, when we talked about pregnant women earlier. There are those that will be breastfeeding uh, my co-anchor at the station. She's currently breastfeeding uh, with her baby and she got, she now has both the, both vaccines. I mean, both shots of the vaccine. So, but she waited a little bit uh, just, just to make sure because there was a little bit of mixed messaging in, in the beginning. Uh, what, what is your message to uh, the out there about that specifically? And um, do you, you think that it will at all, the vaccine, if the mother gets it, it all help out uh, with the baby that might be breastfeeding? Um, thank you for that question, Greg, and thank you all uh, for having me here today. Um, such an important topic to address. Um, so we do actually have data. It's coming out of Harvard uh, where they have looked at mothers that had both COVID-19 uh, and they've also looked at mothers that received the vaccine during pregnancy. We do know uh, this is not specifically what you asked for, but we do know now that when moms get vaccinated, their antibodies do cross the placenta and protect the baby. They found um, antibodies in the umbilical cord. Um, they've also checked those moms that got vaccinated and checked the breast milk. And so they have found antibodies in the breast milk. So um, that lets us know now that when moms get vaccinated, they do produce enough antibodies that they are able to pass that immunity through the breast milk to um, help uh, to protect their, their newborn infants. Um, they also found when they compared the levels for those that actually had COVID-19 versus those that got vaccinated, the antibody level is higher for those that did receive the vaccine compared to those that had natural immunity because they had been exposed to COVID-19. Um, and so again, as my colleague Dr. Moore mentioned, just even more reasons why we should be encouraging our pregnant moms to get vaccinated. Um, they are finding that the earlier in pregnancy the mothers are vaccinated, the higher the antibodies are. Um, as he said, when we are with dealing with our pregnant patients, we are always, no matter what medication we're talking about, vaccinations, anything, we're always trying to balance risks and benefits. And the risk of contracting COVID-19 when you're pregnant, and especially if you have a chronic illness like chronic hypertension or diabetes, is uh, the biggest risk is that you will die. <laughs> the, the, um, the, uh, the immune system is already suppressed in pregnant, pregnancy. And so we are seeing those moms that contract the virus um, have worse outcomes. Um, so again, just more reasons um, for our moms to get vaccinated in, in pregnancy um, to protect them and to pr protect their, uh, their infant. So that does make sense. I, I would think that as we see a lot more people get vaccinated, I, I can imagine that we might have a lot of pregnant women out there that are just kind of waiting just, just to be sure. One of the questions that popped up in the uh, forum that I thought was pretty good, it, it, it's uh, from one of our folks, it says, I know people who won't get the vaccine because it's approved for emergency use. When can we expect to have this vaccine approved fully, any of the vaccines approved fully and not just for emergency use? So those are some educated people that are like, you know, if I hear it's proof for emergency use, I'm like, okay, it's good to go. But some folks that have a little bit more uh, schooling than me think, well, okay, I want to see it fully approved first because they know that there are a few more steps. Can anybody take a stab at that? Maybe Dr. Cho, uh, do you know anything about of when we might get away from this emergency authorization and actually have them approved? So that's a very good question and very educated in, in that regard here too. One of the things, uh, it does take time normally to go for an approval more because the, uh, the standards of a, a regular approval for a biologic license for FDA uh, is, uh, is a little more rigorous in terms of a little bit more uh, requiring of the safety data and a little bit more uh, looking at the long-term aspects of some of the efficacy studies here too. But I do want to assure um, one of the questions that did come up that uh, was asking about whether the safety protocols, anything that we had done in terms of fast tracking these vaccines, uh, was there any shortcuts? Uh, just uh, in terms of that question. And really, although the, um, the safety actually, uh, the timelines were shortened, the safety was not compromised to get to the emergency youth authorization. We worked really closely with each of these companies to make sure that they clearly demonstrated uh, and get clear and compelling 
uh, efficacy uh, data in large, well-designed phase three clinical trials. Each of the companies that were authorized, um, the phase three clinical trials had well over 30,000 persons uh, involved, and there was an incredible amount of uh, rigorous scrutiny on the safety and efficacy. And, and as the results came out for the mRNA vaccines, the uh, efficacy was above 90%, uh, 95% for uh, both of them. And then the Janssen vaccine, which is just a one-dose vaccine, it was over 65% for all the age groups. And so the efficacy was proven within these large clinical trials. Uh, what we'll be doing going forward, and, and we actually had an advisory committee that looked at the data publicly too, so it was available and in a transparent manner for everyone to see. Um, but uh, as we go forward now, we will be working with the companies closely to continue to make sure that the uh, more data is gathered, that they're able to continue to uh, manufacture this, these vaccines appropriately in order to go for that licensure. So we, we do hope that uh, that process will occur in the upcoming months here. Uh, but uh, we're closely with the, working with the companies right now to, do, to achieve that. Thank you for that. Um, this next one, uh, Dr. Kanner, one of our folks were talking about this, and I saw a question pop up about it. Um, why is this vaccine being treated differently than other vaccines? Meaning that, you know, if you get the flu vaccine, you go on about your life. If you get the vaccines that are required for school, you go to school and everything is normal. But with this one, we say get the vaccine, but also we need you to continue wearing a mask or we need you to still stay social distance in certain areas. Why it, that are automatically creates a perception issue and people are like, okay, well, if it's so great, then why do I still have to keep doing these mitigation measures? Uh, what, what do you say to that? Great question, Craig. And, um, you know, it goes along with the other question that we get a lot, which is, um, if I can still get COVID, why, what's the point of getting the vaccine? Um, it's really unlikely to get COVID after you've been fully vaccinated. So fully vaccinated means you've had, if it's a two dose series, you've had both doses and then 14 days or longer after that last dose. Or if it's a Johnson & Johnson, the one and done 14 days after that one dose. After that, you've, you're fully vaccinated. At that point, you are so unlikely to get COVID. We're talking about a fraction of a percentage point, really, when you look on the population level. So of everyone, of everyone in the state that's been fully vaccinated, we've only identified what we call these breakthrough cases in 0.04% of people. Really, really small number. And it goes to vaccines being really, really effective, but not 100%. I mean, no, no vaccine is 100% effective 100% of the time. These are really good. We're talking about 94, 95% at preventing symptomatic disease, which is extraordinary. I, there's, I, I can't even think of more than one or two other vaccines that are that effective, most or less than that, but not 100%. So that balance of the risk, you know, that four or 5% that's on the other side of it, that really depends on how much COVID is out there in the community. If there's not a whole lot of COVID around at all, that 94, 95% is practically 100% because there's not you're not coming in contact with COVID. We've done a lot to reduce transmission, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Until we get transmission down even lower, I think you're still going to see a lot of masking, some distancing. It's still, it's still really important. Um, that really leads to the importance of herd immunity. Like, you know, I've, I've been vaccinated. Um, my wife has been vaccinated. Um, we're not going to feel completely safe until more people around us are vaccinated because that's what's ultimately going to drive down the transmission. So in the interim, you know, we are in this somewhat of an awkward phase where vaccines are available. They're becoming more and more prevalent. And the percentage of people that have taken them has gone up and transmission's going down, but we still gotta get a little bit more before we can totally go back to normal. But that's the hope. Look, every every single day we get a little bit closer to that goal. I guess it's fair to say, you know, if you get the flu vaccine, you don't just go on with your life. You still wash your hands. You still make sure things are, are clean around you. So um, it's kind of hard to compare the two, but uh, I, I understand what you're saying about, you need to get more folks around you and that, that will help us um, at least get towards that. Uh, in that direction. Um, Jonetta, uh, the question we had here, and I thought it was an important one, um, if, and this works at my, at my television station, just about everybody has been vaccinated and we work in a newsroom, so we're, we're a little bit close um, and everybody's been fully vaccinated at this point. 
but we still wear masks. Uh, what do you say to people that are like, okay, well, you know, the, the people in my office and, and the question specifically, I think it's one of the LDH employees, that the people around me, they're all vaccinated. We're all good to go. Do we have to still, why do we have to still keep wearing the mask here in the office setting? You know, we get this question a lot. Um, you know, with the recent guidance about masking and vaccinations, uh, we've received a lot of questions. Uh, so here's the guidance. If you are fully vaccinated, which means it's been more than two weeks after the second dose in a two dose series like a Pfizer or Moderna, or if it's been more than two weeks after a single dose vaccine like Johnson & Johnson or Janssen, uh, people can visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors without masks or social distancing. Um, another part of the guidance is um, people who are fully, fully vaccinated can visit indoors with other unvaccinated people from a single household who are low risk without masks or social distancing. And then the last part of that advice is if you are fully vaccinated, you can actually refrain from quarantining and testing following a known exposure to COVID-19 if you are asymptomatic. So in addition to the CDC guidance, you know, it's, it's good to just follow you know, the direction of your mother. <laughs> Use your common sense and follow your instincts. If you feel like you should wear a mask, wear a mask. Even if you're fully vaccinated, if you're in a large crowd and you feel like you're uncomfortable or you know that you have immunity issues or other chronic issues, or you know, to that second uh, point about being around unvaccinated people and not wearing a mask, if you don't know if they're low risk. So if you feel like you need to wear a mask, still wear a mask. Um, use your own instincts in offering a layer, um, an extra layer of protection for yourself. And, you know, it's very important to follow the guidance as well as pay attention to your surroundings and be cognizant of the environment in which you're given at the time. If I could add to that, that was a really great response. Think of it like wearing a seatbelt and using airbags. Seatbelts and airbags, I mean, of course, they don't prevent you from getting hurt in an accident 100% of the time, but they're pretty darn good. And you would be remiss if you didn't use them and you got to an accident. That's the same thing about these vaccines. Extraordinarily good at preventing, but nothing's 100%. So you always want layers of protection. I think that uh, we, we, we all learned that uh, some of us might have underlying conditions that we didn't really think were would be an underlying condition in a situation like this. People manage their diabetes all the time, but they never would have dreamed that a virus, you know, that could be an underlying condition one day that, that could kill them. Um, so your, your recommendation to people, it sounds like to me, especially if you have one of those underlying conditions that and there's been a lot of them now identified, still really be strong with a lot of these mitigation measures just because you're really protecting yourself, even with the vaccine, but with others in your family. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. Um, we'll give you the guidance. Uh, we'll let you know what the new guidance is, but you know, it's so important to just listen to your instincts. If you still feel that you should wear a mask, although you're fully vaccinated, absolutely do so. Um, you know, like uh, Dr. Uh, um, Senator Barrow said before, and Dr. Gillespie, you know, it protects you and protects the person around you. So uh, it's just important to make sure that you're listening uh, to that inner voice and use the mask if you, uh, if you feel that you should. One of the questions we got uh, in either one of the uh, doctors that deal with uh, pregnant mothers maybe can answer this, but th this has to deal with before you see them as pregnant women. Have there been any studies done on the vaccines and what they may do to somebody's fertility? So um, I'll, I'll take that and then I'll ask if Dr. Moore wants to chime in as well. Um, so I have been on a quest to figure out where this uh, myth came from uh, that the vaccine would, would impact your fertility. There are no studies showing that the vaccine will impact your fertility, that it causes infertility. Um, it is a, a small rumor that has taken on a life of its, of its own. Um, what happened is there was a German, um, a German researcher who is uh, an anti, he's against vaccines, he's an anti-vaccinator. He proposed that the spike protein that's on the vaccine um, we all know that that's what causes uh, the immune response, that the spike protein on the vaccine is similar to a spike protein that's on the placenta, and that when you would create this immune response from the vaccine, that would cause you to create an immune response um, to the embryo, and you would not be able to get pregnant. 
they have gone and looked at the genomic makeup of both the vaccine as well as the, the uh, spike protein that's on the placenta that he made this theory from, and they are completely different. Um, and so that has been debunked, and uh, and there are no there's no data that shows uh, that infertil that that infertility is associated with the vaccines. In fact, in the clinical trials in um, the Pfizer vaccine trial in particular, 26 individuals um, did get pregnant um, during uh, the trial. Uh, 20, I believe it was um, half were in the vaccinated group, and the other half were in the placebo group. Um, there are no clinical trials. Um, if you think about how clinical trials are set up, um, there would not really be a way uh, to give the vaccine uh, to some people and not others and then say, go get pregnant. So, so we can't really test that in a clinical trial. So we have to have to just look at the, uh, the data. And so um, again, no evidence that, it, that the vaccine causes infertility. What would you say to the people out there who say, uh, we understand that, you know, that they tested the vaccines, but we're we're only as good as they are far ahead of us, if that makes sense. Like, like if all of a sudden in a year from now, that trial group, things start happening, like then we should be worried. Is that possible that something like that could happen that uh, we don't know what's coming down the line or is that more kind of things you might see in a movie type thing? Does that make sense, that question? I'll just take a stab at that. Yes, that completely okay. makes sense. And that's one of the reasons why we continue to have uh, really this uh, extensive surveillance system in place to make sure that um, between FDA and CDC, there are multiple surveillance systems, both passive and active surveillance systems, where we are able to gather data from the community to make sure that uh, what we're seeing uh, now continues to be the safety uh, measures that are still continue being placed uh, down the road here too. So as we go along, we'll continue to be able to get, gather this information. Like I said, in, in a transparent manner, we'll, we'll make sure that the um, that the uh, physicians as well as the community knows about um, uh, anything that might come up that would be unusual adverse events. I think I think that's, um, that's a really important point. You know, just in the broad sense of vaccines, this. I like the way that you phrased it, Greg. Like, it is kind of like Hollywood stuff to think that you're going to get a vaccine, do fine for a couple months, and then two years down the line have mm -hmm. something horrible happen to you. We really don't see that with vaccines. That just doesn't happen with vaccines. If there's going to be a reaction, it tends to happen very, very quickly. That's that's what we know from decades and decades of experience with vaccines. But to Dr. Cho's other point, which I think is, is so very important, um, if anyone has questions about how serious the FDA and the CDC are taking safety and transparency with this, look at what just happened with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It only took six cases of this very rare clotting syndrome, six cases, to prompt the FDA and the CDC to hit pause. And that was a tough call because it made it mean we didn't get to vaccinate people with that vaccine for two weeks. We, we took a hit with that. And only six cases did that. Um, that's a strong commitment to transparency right there. And the fact that they were able to capture six cases, identify and know about it so quickly is miraculous, even in and of itself. And we just would not have had that ability to know that so quickly 20 years ago. We've got these great monitoring systems now. So the larger question, what do people think about safety in general? That very monitoring system that was able to identify those six cases of J&J, &J, that same system is in place for the Pfizer vaccine and for the Moderna vaccine. Very well monitored vaccines. And after watching that unfold with J&J, &J, I have every confidence now that if there was some type of signal, if people were having some weird reaction, not only would we know about it very quickly, but the FDA and the CDC would do the right thing and ring the bell on it. I, I think it's, it's kind of hard, and I see some people kind of talking about it in the chat, it's enough to deal with the legitimate concerns and that really educated question we had about, you know, emergency use authorization versus the full Monty. But then you have to deal with all these other things. And somebody was talking about the, the tracking chip and that they're changing your DNA and they're, you know, the government's trying to do like all these far-fetched things. So you have to almost have to stamp those down first before you can even get to the legitimate ones because with social media, some of these things, they just take off, I think, uh, Dr. Uh, Gillespie was talking about that was, you know, it, it's like, where did these myths even start? And unfortunately people have too much time on their hands and then they come up with these wild things, but 
you know, they have just enough truth if you watch a lot of TV to where you might believe it. So you have to kind of get those down as well, right? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, listen to people like Dr. Gillespie and li listen to people that work every day in this field and ask them what they're doing for themselves and for their families. Like, I mean, I didn't disclose this initially, but um, my wife and I are expecting, we, we just entered the third trimester today, actually. And my wife, thank you. My, my wife got vaccinated during pregnancy and she's now completely vaccinated. It's if you talk to people that really study this, they'll tell you the risks of getting COVID while you're pregnant or expecting or trying to get pregnant, far, far, far outweigh any risk about getting vaccine. We already have one of the highest more, more, um, maternal mortality rates in the country. And that's been made worse because of COVID. COVID is dangerous for pregnant moms and it's dangerous for newborns and, and fetuses. The vaccine really can help there. Uh, Dr. Cho, real quick while we're on this, uh, and anybody else can chime in on this one, uh, it's a question we get a lot, and we've gotten it several times today. How long are these vaccines going to be effective? Um, when do we need to get a booster shot? Is there any guidance on that? Is this something we're going to have to get every year, twice a year? So, yeah, we, we get that question quite often. Um, so right now, um, since these vaccines really have only been on the market or well authorized really for the past, uh, what, I guess four months right now, and then really only uh, one or two months for Janssen. And so we are continuing to gather the data at, at this point. Um, as has been said multiple times here already though that um, they are highly effective in terms of how they were viewed and, and studied within the large clinical trials, the phase three clinical trials. And we're continue to um, continue to monitor those uh, those persons closely too to see exactly whether um, uh, in terms of how long the immunity is lasting. And, and so it's ongoing studies that we're we're looking at right now. And multiple groups are starting to look obviously at whether a booster shot is ne necessary. And um, a, a lot of the key will to, will be how effective they'll be these vaccines that will be currently against some of the uh, circulating variant strains that are out there too. So a lot of groups uh, inter nationally and internationally are looking at those variant strains, studying them to see exactly how well uh, the current vaccines, so the company doing this to cur their current vaccines, how well they work against those, those variants themselves too, and how well our current vaccines are covering us against what is circulating within for us within the United States. And so all that data continues to be gathered along, uh, along the way right now too. So. Uh, it's it's an ongoing picture, I guess, an uh, evolving story is how I'll kind of just put that at this point. But but so far we do know that um, the vaccines are incredibly effective, uh, at least through the six six month mark, and and we are continuing to look more and more as we extend through this pandemic here too. So uh, we're all learning this together as we go along, and as soon as we know more, we'll continue to always uh, release information that we're able to. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate that. Senator Barrow, one of the questions that popped up in the comments, it says, uh, what do I do if uh, one of our faith-based leaders is, uh, I don't know if it went this far, but preaching against the vaccine or at least speaking against the vaccine. We know how important the church has been in the African-American community going back even before the civil rights, but even in, in the slave days. Pastors hold a lot of weight in this. I've not noticed that anywhere in any of the churches that I've seen or the people that I know, but obviously it's out there. How do we combat that at all? If, if your pastor is, is telling you one thing and then you're seeing on TV and your doctor and everybody else is telling you something else. Uh, thank you, uh, Greg. You know, when I, I saw that question, I, I thought about the same thing. And the first thing that came to my mind is what the word of God says about obeying the law of the land. And I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, the word of God tells us. And so for those who are preachers, the word of God says that we should obey the law of the land. And so if the law of the land is that individuals should wear masks and should do those things to be safe, then that is what our pastor should be encouraging. But I think probably the strongest way to combat that is to have people who, the pastors who do believe, have them actually continue to tell the message about the importance of us educating our parishioners the proper way and making sure that that message is getting out so that pastors who may not be doing it, um, maybe their message will counteract the pastors who are not doing it. But the, the word of God tells us to obey the law of the land and pastors who, who are not doing that and they're not following what the word of God is telling them to do. And we can't pick and choose what part of the Bible we wanna <laughs> obey. 
Very true. Very true. Uh, I appreciate that answer. Uh, Dr. Rooney, um, one of the questions, and uh, I think this one can be directed towards you because so many of the people that you deal with, nurses, contracted COVID during you know, this whole entire pandemic. Uh, I've heard this myself, that if you've already had COVID, if you get the vaccine, your side effects are going to be a, a lot worse. Is that something you've noticed in your nurses, or is that something that your nurses have talked about, and just what, what can you say about that? Yeah, I think it's actually the opposite. I mean, I, I would ask Dr. Uh, Kander to also, you know, speak to this, but I would say that the the effects of the virus itself, when you have the vaccine and are fully vaccinated, if you were to contract the vaccine, which is possible, especially if it's between that window where you're waiting for full immunity, um, your your symptoms should be a lot less. So the vaccine should mitigate those symptoms as opposed to magnify the symptoms. Yeah, and I, and I, I think, and I might have phrased it wrong, I, I think what, what they're saying is, is if you had COVID, let's say in March, and you get the vaccine now, the, the rumor or the, you know, what's on social media is, if you've had COVID in the past and you get the vaccine now, your symptoms are a lot, or your uh, reaction to the vaccine is a lot worse. So you've had a lot of nurses that probably have had COVID in the past that have now gotten vaccinated. Did you see anything with their symptoms where they magnified or, or anything like that? Anecdotally, no, I can't speak to that, but I would say no, that's not, that has not been the case. Dr. Cantor? Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. It's, it's just really variable who gets uh, the mild reaction. I mean, we're talking about relatively mild reactions. We're talking about arm soreness, a low-grade fever, feeling like crud for 24 hours, you know, that's that's usually what we're talking about. And it's, it's just really variable. And you talk to people that have gotten the vaccine, some people have gotten it and some people haven't. Sometimes you're a little bit more likely to get those if you're younger with this vaccine, strangely, and less likely if you're older. But there doesn't appear to be a whole lot of rhyme and reason. Sometimes it's just luck. The other question that goes along with that, which I've seen in the chat a little bit, is do I need the vaccine if I had COVID? Why should I get the vaccine if, if I have COVID? You do. And this is why. There are some viruses that you actually get much better protection from a vaccine, excuse me, from, from, from a vaccine than you do from the actual infection itself. Chicken pox and shingles is one example. You, you, know, you can still get shingles throughout life after having the chicken pox of the same virus. What we have found so far with COVID is the protection you get after a natural infection, meaning you just contracted COVID a few months ago, the protection weans and it doesn't hold strong. And that's why we're seeing people get infected with COVID a second time. I've actually seen clinically a few people infected for a third time now. We've had the pandemic for 13 months. Lots of people have had repeat infections after just being infected with COVID. The protection you get from these vaccines is much more durable, which means it, it, it lasts longer and it's stronger. So it's not enough protection just to have had COVID. You really get much more protection after getting these vaccines. Um, on, on that, uh, I was reading through the chat there. Uh, Dr. Cho, if I could real quick back to you. Um, we talked about the booster shots and you said we're continuing to monitor things. Is there any kind of timeline on when we might have a better issue of when you might have to get a booster shot, if you need one at all? Yeah, so just like we were just talking about, it, it, there isn't a set timeline in place. Like, it, the, if they continue to show high efficacy in terms of uh, protective efficacy for us, then uh, we might not need a booster shot within the next year, who knows? And, and so I think there's a lot of um, still information that needs to be gathered regarding this. So it's not, that, and I wouldn't even say at this point, it's not necessarily necess necessary that we might need a booster shot. Most likely at some point it will be because there are variants out there. There's a waning immunity that might happen down the road, but that's still, I, I would say in my mind, still a question at this point too. So lots of information still necessary on that. Uh, 
One of the questions that we got, uh, let's, let me see here, I was trying to get back to it. I just want to make sure we, we got, and, and just a reminder, all the questions in the chat that are coming up, if we do not get to them, they're going to also uh, answer all these for you and they'll send them out in a um, in an email to all the LDH employees and that'll also be on the LDH website. Uh, so that will be some good news there. Uh, let's see, uh, I was trying to find it, but I don't know if I can find it. Here people are. Yeah, I, the, the main question we're getting outside of the congratulations to Dr. Cantor is that the, the, the booster shot question. Um, I did want to circle back to Dr. Moore, if, if I could, because um, we're continuing to get a, a lot of questions about pregnant uh, mothers. And you said that COVID really attacks a pregnant woman. Is that because of her pregnancy or is it if she has uh, additional um underlying conditions. Is that why, or just a, a what we would normally call a normally healthy pregnant mother, does COVID attack her just because she's pregnant uh, more aggressively? So uh, it seems to be a, a, a twofold process that's occurring. Um, when you're pregnant, your, your immunity uh, levels actually go down uh, in an effort for you to actually, you know, carry for the baby so that your body doesn't necessarily uh, fight off your pregnancy. So your actual natural immune suppression goes down during pregnancy. But the conditions of when you get COVID really overreact to kind of baseline inflammatory states. So things like diabetes and hypertension cause a baseline inflammation in your body. And then when you throw COVID on top of it, uh, it really just kind of sets off like a wildfire. And we, we've seen uh, preterm births, we've seen uh, people clotting off uh, limbs and different things like that because the pregnancy itself is, is allowing the virus to attack easier, but then when it gets in with these patients that have these underlying risk factors, it just, it, 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 it provides this kind of, uh, sets a fire to the gasoline that's already there. And so pregnancy itself is also a state of where you clot your blood a lot easier, so you're preparing for the delivery. And, and this virus will attack that inflammatory pathway, then it kicks over to a clotting pathway, and it's allowing people to get really sick, starts clotting off their kidneys, starts causing clots in their lungs and different things like that. So uh, pregnancy, you know, it, it, it sets you up to get infected easier. And then those who have underlying risk factors, it just, just, it's just a snowball effect once that occurs. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate it. Um, this is one of the questions. We, I just saw this question pop up a couple of times, and I was actually having a conversation with one of our photographers at the station who is not fully vaccinated, and it's because he's had COVID, and he says, well, I've got the antibodies. What, what, are, what do you say to people who say that, and then uh, how long are these antibodies effective? Um, you know, if you had COVID last month versus at the beginning of the pandemic, um, obviously, I would think that the guidance would be still get vaccinated, but I think that there is the conception out, misconception out there that people, I've had COVID, I'm good to go for a little while. Dr. Kanner? The, the, the CDC says right now that once you've had COVID, after three months, all bets are off. And, and for example, if you've had COVID and then a few weeks later, you come in contact with someone else who's positive, you don't have to quarantine within those first three months. Um, because you have some natural protection. But after three months, all bets are off. That's not the case with the vaccines. Um, again, I mean, what we, what we know so far is that the vaccines offer not only stronger, but more durable, meaning longer lasting protection than the natural infection does. Um, I know some people think it's a bummer because you want to say, hey, <laughs> I've had COVID, I've, I paid my dues, you know, I, why do I need to get the shot? But you just get much more much more protection out there. And look, I mean, number one, no one wants to get a shot, but um, as Senator Barrow mentioned in the chat, I totally agree with her. It's, it's, it's much better than getting COVID. It's, it's much better than getting COVID. And, and number two, just think about all that we've sacrificed and lost these past 13 months. In that respect, getting a vaccine is, is, is a small thing to do to help get back to normal and, and save some more lives. What do we do is, and anyone can answer this, um, so many of the people on this call are medical professionals. And I would imagine if you work anywhere in the medical field, you are the doctor for your family. Everybody calls you with, you know, hey, we've got this with that going on or texting you about all that. Um, 
what responsibility or what can uh, folks in the medical community, whether you're a doctor or whatever it may be, what, what, what more do we need to do? Is there anything that uh, should you be on social media combating things or like how, I guess, what is the responsibility of, of the folks in the medical community and what do we need to do that's new or different that, that kind of tamps down some of this? And I'll open that up to anybody who, who may have some suggestions or personal stories within their own families. So I would like to, oh, sorry, Dr. Gillespie. It's okay, you can go ahead and then I'll go. <laughs> okay, thanks. So I did want to <clears throat> mention that we've had a lot of questions related to misinformation, even misinformation being posted by nurses themselves who may not be clear or aware. And so number one, I think it's really important to speak the truth and continuously putting put out the information and LDH has done a phenomenal job with that. I have to acknowledge you for the work that you've done. But I, I think also then not, you know, anyone who has a belief and they're putting it out there on social media, you're not gonna win that social media belief battle. But I think that it is more important to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that you know who may think differently than you and help them recognize what is fact and what is based in science and evidence and to support people in, in kind of pulling them into the awareness of what is the truth about the vaccination, especially being trusted healthcare professionals. I think that's one of the best things that, that we can do. Dr. Gillespie? I think for me, what's been most impactful is to is to share my story, um, and I'll I'll share it today. Um, so when I heard this, that the vaccine was being created and and it was going to be released, I was one of those people who said, "That's great, everybody go get the vaccine. Let me see what happens, and then I'll get it later." <laughs> um, and my perspective was from a from a research perspective. I have been the principal investigator of. Um, three clinical trials for a, uh, a medication for, for treating uterine fibroids. And I knew the length of time that it took to get that medication um, approved by the FDA. And so in my mind, I could not understand the, how the vaccine was created in such a short time period. But once I did my own um, investigation and studying it and learning and realized that all of the phases to create the vaccine were all the same and they were all there the same as they have been for any other vaccine or any other medication, it was just done in a time frame so that the phases were overlapping, then that, that made me understand, okay, this I feel safe about it. And so when I got vaccinated, um, I actually put it on social media um, and uh, some, the hospital, some other people did too, but I, I put it on social media and I, and I told just that story um, to help people understand that I also had the same hesitancy that they had and this was my process and this is how I came to my conclusion. And um, I, I didn't expect it to be as impactful as it was, but I had... Um, people that I grew up with from elementary school contacted me to say that I was somebody that they could identify with and someone that they trusted. And that by me getting the vaccine and sharing my story, they felt more comfortable going to get the vaccine themselves. Um, so more than getting on, as Dr. Rooney said, more than getting on social media and trying to debunk all, all of the 50,000 myths that are out there, just to share, I think, our own personal journey and, and, and what we've done, um, our process and getting the vaccine, I think is, is very, very influential. And has everybody, all of our panelists, everybody's been vaccinated, uh, you and your, uh, I, I guess, the, the people you live with? Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like we've got everybody. So that that's some good news there. But did anybody run into any issues where um, people that you know are smart people, it could be your mom, your dad, your wife, your husband, whomever, your partner, whomever it may be, and they didn't want to get it? They didn't want to get the vaccine? Have, have you run into that where it's like people that are close to you and it's like you're ready to, you've got all your battle armor on, you're ready to go sell the vaccine, and then you're like, wait a minute, people in my own house are a little bit hesitant. Did you have to work through any issues on that, anybody? I can speak to that. Um, my parents, it, it took forever to encourage them to get the vaccine. And my mother was a staunch, no, thank you, until <laughs> I until I got COVID. 
So uh, my whole house was hit with COVID. Thankfully, it wasn't bad. It wasn't terrible, uh, but it was enough for her to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get that shot. So, you know, sometimes it takes real life examples uh, for that kind of thing to happen. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it had to happen that way, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it happened in a way so that uh, now my dad and my mother um, have gotten their second vaccine and they hadn't had any side effects, but you know, it's always still kind of like, hmm, well, I just hiccuped. Let me just see what is that on the list, you know? So um, yeah, that's my personal story. Yes, I did as well. Um, uh, initially, my mom was very much opposed to uh, getting a uh, vaccination. And then of course, you know, our own personal story, um, you know, I had it, my grandson had it, and my husband had it, and we all had like varying degrees of it. Um, my grandson was extremely mild, mine was moderate, and then my husband ended up being deadly. Uh, but after that, uh, my my father immediately uh, got his, and my mom was still hesitant. Uh, hmm. But as she began to get more information, as she began to kind of read up on it more, then she called me and said, hey, look, I want to go get vaccinated. Um, so a lot of people have reached out to me and have shared with me because I've been so open and so transparent about the process, my process, personal process, um, that they have gone out to get their vaccination. But I do want to remind everybody that's listening, over 10,000 families in Louisiana have lost a loved one. And I'm gonna tell you that is nowhere near easy. Death is never easy. But when you have this unknown virus who has invaded our land that we could not see, we were fighting an enemy that we could not see. And now we are being presented with the option of something that we can do within our own will, within, within our own power to make sure that we are safe and our families are safe. Um, to me, it just makes sense. It, whatever fears that you may have, whatever doubts that you may have, you know, ultimately, whatever could happen as a result of having this virus, it's not more than the death that people have experienced. Um, so, you know, I'm really encouraging people to really dig deep and to do that. It's our responsibility. You know, I have to share this uh, because it really hit me one day. If I ever thought that me going out and coming back in every day gave my husband that virus. You know, it would be very hard for me to really live with myself. Uh, I know I tried to be extremely careful uh, when I was going out and about, but what we don't know, because it is an invisible enemy and it can penetrate in different forms, you know, given the vaccine is one of the ways that we can have a safeguard uh, that can protect you and your family. Uh, and I wouldn't want anybody to experience what 10,000 families have experienced uh, in Louisiana over the last 13 months. Senator, thank you so much for uh, being so strong, really, um, in, in dealing with this. Uh, I know there are probably days where it, it hits you just out of nowhere. And it's something that you, you yeah. shared with me on the phone that, you know, you just, you had no idea. I mean, you, a year ago, you all were out of the country enjoying yourselves and then a year later you're doing this. so i just think that uh, so many families can continue to learn from that very struggle that it is something uh, that just can kind of literally hit you out of nowhere and thank god we are so much uh, further along than we were just even a few months ago so thank you for that that's right thank and you I, yeah absolutely and I, I think all of our panelists for uh, joining us uh, i did want as we're wrapping things up was there anything that maybe was on your mind that you did not get to answer or discuss Again, a lot of the questions that were in the chat and a lot of the questions that you sent in uh, to all the LDH folks out there, uh, they will be answered and they will be sent out uh, in a document and then you'll also see it on the LDH website. But of any of our uh, very distinguished panelists, and I, I thank you all so much for your candor. I think that's really what's been so great is that each one of you have just kind of opened up. It's not a, you know, a, a really smart person telling you things. It's just, you're just sharing your story. So if anybody has anything that they want to share and add to this that we did not uh, before we close, I just want to give you that opportunity now. I wanted to mention one thing um, that the governor hit on in his opening comments to us. Um, if you've already been vaccinated, and particularly if you work for LDH or, or any other state agency, I'd like to ask you to think of yourself as an ambassador and talk to those around you, talk to other people in your life, whether it's coworkers or friends or family or neighbors and um, see if they have questions. I think it's important to honor people's questions here. The pandemic has been so confusing and fast paced and scary and people have a lot of questions. And to Dr. Gillespie's point, um, 
the power of a personal antidote can be really profound. And they might be asking the same question that you yourself had. And walking people through your own thought process can really be powerful. So I think that's how we're going to make some more progress is if people can kind of farm out and try and touch the people around them, see what questions they have, act as an ambassador on behalf of the state of Louisiana, really, and see if you can get their questions answered and make them feel more comfortable because you might actually save their life by doing so. It really can be a profound statement. Thank you, doctor, for that. I, I, I think that's very, very, very true. Does anyone else have anything that they wanted to add? All right, looks good. Dr. Kanner, uh, I was just talking to somebody the other day and they said, uh, I, when you, in your, well, what was a weekly press briefing, I, I guess it's scaled back a little bit, but I mean, we were seeing a lot of you and the governor up there and they were always um, reassured when you would come to the podium and uh, the guy told me, he said, it, it seems like he doesn't have a dog in the fight. He just kind of gives it to you straight. And I thought about that was a great compliment, but then I also thought it's even better because you do have a dog in the fight. You do want to get see people get vaccinated. You do want to see mitigation measures, but people can't see that in your presentation because you are so balanced in it. So I think that's appreciative. And I would say that most of the LDH employees are very happy to have you up there so many times. So thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Phillips and all the folks, all the leadership, and then all the people that are on the front lines that are part of this chat, we, we appreciate you. And thank you to all of our panelists too. Thank you for taking your time and we won't keep you anymore. So all of this will be available uh, on LDH's website. And we thank you so much for joining us today. Bye-bye.